Hey everybody, this is Howie Simon and I will see you very soon on Border City Rock Talk. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk, where you get great news, great interviews, great interviewees, sometimes a comedic touch. Today I have, I don't know if I'm going to call him a journeyman or if uh, that's a slight, but I'm going to ask him. We've got Howie Simon, uh, guitar shredder. How are you doing, Howie? I am doing well. How are you doing? Not too bad. So um, the term journeyman, it, uh, is that something that... Uh, you've been asked about before because you, you're a very, very uh, great guitar player. I believe uh, I read you started teaching at 17. Is that correct? Yeah, probably roughly around that time. I had some students at a music store in my old hometown. Yeah. So, wow. It's, it's, it's to say that out loud is weird. It makes me feel so damn old, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that vein, that's what I'm saying is, um, you know, I mean, you're definitely a guitar um, virtuoso, your teacher, um you've uh you make a living from playing guitar and teaching guitar as well as you've performed with many um top-notch entertainers i mean i just saw something on uh, youtube you were uh, playing with lita ford um while well, jeff scott soto um you've been uh you know with him um in his solo projects and whatnot uh, for a few decades and um i mean if you filled in for fucking tesla Striper, you name it, the list goes on and on. I believe Graham bought it. So, journeyman, though, um, is is that a term you've been asked before? Do you, do you consider yourself a journeyman, uh, a hired gun? I, I mean, I I can't say I've been asked about it the way you're asking about it, but like, you know, every situation that you just mentioned, people that I played with, um, every situation's been different as to how. I got that gig. Sometimes I'm a sub. Sometimes it's like a all-star project with guests. Sometimes it's kind of like a band. Sometimes I'm just a right, like, you know, the thing I've been doing probably the longest now is uh, playing with Winger for the last six years. Right. And I, I'm a sub for Winger. So I'm not in the band, but I'm, it's a regular thing where I, you know, I'm kept in the loop on the gigs and if the guy that I sub for, John Roth, can't make it, uh, because he also the reason he he subs it out is because he also plays with Starship featuring Mickey Thomas. So if he can't make a gig, you know, I'm sort of at the ready for that. But you know, if something else comes in along the way, I take it. I just it's this is not something I plan. It's just you know sometimes everybody's life kind of you know. I thought by now I would be in something that was bigger than Metallica and be a huge star and be you know, sipping whiskey in my Rolls Royce, but you just go, you go where, you go where the money is at the time. Yeah, and, and you know, you, you, your, your path is led by your, your, you know, your instincts as well. So you, I'm sure with your talent, you, you've probably turned down a few um, offers that uh, maybe they're in a, another level, but I mean, um, now, how would you describe your style? I would describe it um, from a lot of the stuff I've heard. I think would neoclassical kind of be something that um, you're comfortable with saying that that's yeah, because, kind of your style? I mean, I, I can play that kind of stuff, and I grew up listening to it, and I love it. And I mean, but, you know, if, if I sit and really listen to stuff I've done and then listen to famous guys who do that, like Ingve and and whoever else – I don't really sound like that, you know. My, I, I, Ingve was my favorite guitar player growing up, like far and away. But as I got older, I, I got, I tried to get away from that a little bit more. And you know, I also had influences like Gary Moore and John Sykes and stuff like that that wasn't so storm the castle sounding, so to speak. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I, I, I would just say like a hard rock player that's how i usually if, if somebody just says what do you play i say i'm a hard rock guitar player that's the the blanket term that i use right and and you mentioned somebody that i'm very fond of is john sykes i mean i'm a big fan of adrian vandenberg um who 
really helped put, I think, I think he helped White Snake uh, and David get on the map internationally, commercially with that uh, Here I Go Again. And everybody knows the story. Uh, well, a lot of people, you probably know it, but uh, John wrote most of the material. But Adrian came in and uh, just made that dynamic solo. But, whoa, whoa, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. What drug are you on? Because I want some that you... Feels a little weird. <laughs> yes! <laughs> just said Ingve came in. I didn't mean Ingve. Sorry, I meant John. I Give meant me I meant I meant um, Adrian. Adrian. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean Wingy. I meant Adrian. Is what I meant. Adrian. So Adrian Vandenberg came in during some uh, times, obviously, um, when they were doing the the um, White Snake album was still of the night and stuff. But John wrote most of that music, right? No, um, I hate to disagree with you, but you're wrong. Hmm. The whole record was done by John Sykes, co-writing with Coverdale, playing on every single thing. And at the very end, there was one guitar solo left to do, which was just the solo for Here I Go Again. And at that point, Sykes was already on his way out or out of the band, as far as I know. And Adrian came in and just played that one solo. Now he's in the videos for all that stuff because the band that recorded it, Neil Murray and Ainsley Dunbar, mm -hmm. they were already gone by the time they were filming the videos and, and there was a, I guess there was I, you know look I'm talking about White Snake like I was in the band I'm just going by what I've read and seen online and talked to people but Coverdale had a deviated septum and had to have surgery for yeah. it and like the band expected to just like immediately when the record's done go out on tour yeah and Coverdale's like I can't I can't go I got to do the surgery and there's going to be recovery time I guess the band got mad maybe Somebody, I don't know. I, I, I could I, look. I could be totally wrong on this, but I, I heard that somebody maybe demanded a per, uh, uh, a retainer fee. I mean, mm -hmm. and you know he could he didn't want to pay it, so everybody got mad. They got in arguments, and everybody left at that point. And that's when he got the the band that we know from the video. But you're not hearing any of those guys other than the solo for Here I Go Again. That yeah, I mean when I when I do um upload this tomorrow um. Uh, Howie, I think you're going to be like, oh, shit. No, I did say John Sykes wrote most of the material. Yeah, no, he wrote all of the material. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Except for the Here I Go Again solo, I believe that's that's an individual Adrian Vandenberg solo. Solo, and let's go back. He did not write Here I Go Again or Crying in the Rain. Those were old White Snake songs that were right. formerly put out. They were written by Bernie Marsden, and they were on the Saints and Sinners record. Right. And they re-recorded those, so yeah. Right, so basically, um, yeah, so I'm just saying I'm a big fan of John Sykes, and um, he was an influence of yours, obviously. Um, I wish, um, I w I've been trying to get an interview with John, but I guess he doesn't do many interviews. Now, right now, who would you say is an up-and-coming, um, great, let's say underrated guitar player in the circles that um, you're, um, you frequent? I'm not really in any guitar circles anymore. Um, the, everybody's talking about this Italian kid. That, is it Matteo uh, Mancuso that I, I've seen some clips of him recently? He's the guy that plays unbelievably fast but doesn't use a pick. He's what? Using, oh, you haven't seen this guy? No, he just finger picks? Yeah, but it sounds like he's using a pick. It's insane. I, Steve Vai's been championing him a little bit. He's he's incredible. I You know... He's incredible from the point of, of a modern guy where you see it on YouTube and you go, whoa. But, you know, to me, and I'm not, I'm not shitting on anybody, I'm, I'm not shitting on anything, but I, I'm a little bit of a curmudgeon. As I, I examine all, you know, all these players that you see online and I say to myself, am I going to sit and listen to this guy while I'm driving in my car? And the right. answer is almost, if not always, no, I'm not. I, I'm, as much as I hate to say it, if I'm listening to music for enjoyment, I'm going to go back to older stuff that I've known for a long time that's more pleasing to me than all these quote unquote up and coming players. You know, I just, I, I just feel that, you know, back before everybody was creating content in their bedrooms and living rooms, everybody was playing with other musicians, like interacting with other musicians. They were doing gigs. They were, you know, out there in the field slugging away, which is kind of what I did. You know, when I was younger, I was playing gig after gig after gig after gig, whatever I could find. And, you know, these new guys who can sit and edit and 
and make everything perfect. And if they don't like it, they can stop their recording and put yeah. it up. You know, that it's just there's a there's a lack of a certain feeling. And I'm not the only person saying this. I just read U Uli Roth just had a big interview that he did recently and I read that online and you know, he said everything that I'm thinking right now. Yeah, I, I I've interviewed Uli a couple of times and yeah, no, I'm in I'm in the same boat as you. Um a lot of players on YouTube can play and well there's a difference between now and say thirty years ago. You've got different enhancements um, with your effects and your pedals and your um, the technology on the guitar. Like, I mean, the action is so low and all these kind of things can be manipulated where is if you give somebody just a Gibson or a, or a Fender Strat uh, 20 years uh, ago um, and just a standard, let's say a tube amp or a baseman, that's where you would find the talent, I would think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Um, I mean, <laughs> you've always been able to lower your action and 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 get guitar pedals; those have been around forever. Mm -hmm. But it's it's the digital age of of creating this false narrative online of like absolute perfection. And if something goes wrong, you just stop and start your recording again, or or do that again. And there's no, you know, there's no live aspect to almost anything I'm seeing when I'm. You know, late at night doing what we all do now is scrolling through Instagram reels or Facebook reels or any of those things. You know, the little 30 to 60 second clip of some guitar player who's just insane chops, but almost always their vibrato is, is god awful or they don't have a single song, you know, that you can remember. No, I'm not humming anybody's song for after that. I'm just going, wow, look, the chops are insane, but the vibrato is terrible. And, and then you never hear from them again. And it's sad because some of those people should be out playing gigs and interacting with other musicians in a live setting and, and getting out the warts and all the, the, the bad things by, by doing it as it happens, not going in and editing out all the crap. Yeah, and so what, what, what would you say is um, more important to say making it in the music industry per se, in the realm of there's a lot of people on YouTube and there's a lot of people that can sit in their bedrooms and just play great guitar, whether it's shredding, whether it's just rhythm and, and whatnot. But to be able to be on stage, and I've seen some clips of you on stage, there's the difference. That's what makes, I'm, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, um, I don't know what word I was going to use, but to see somebody like you on stage where you're, you don't have to look at your, your down at the neck. And you can look at the audience and you can interact and you can play and you can even improvise and have that feel. I mean, that's, I think, what separates um, somebody that may be technically a little bit better than, than let's say, um, an Eddie Van Halen, uh, rest in peace, or um, a Howie Simon or a George Lynch. You know what, do you know what I'm saying? You have to have that mentality and the, the, be able to, to perform. Yeah, uh, there's, of course, but you you don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not comparing myself to Eddie Van Halen. You did that. I have nowhere near Eddie Van Halen or George Lynch, not even close. <laughs> but um, and, unless you're doing that all the time and getting used to being in front of an audience, it can be nerve wracking. I just came back from um, the NAMM show, the, the right. music industry trade show that's down here in Anaheim, about an hour south of me. And I was talking to a buddy of mine who's works at a, a guitar booth. I, I won't say names so that way whoever I'm about to talk about doesn't, you know, think I'm an, an asshole or whatever. But mm -hmm. their booth had live performers. And he told me that, you know, his boss decided to go with guys who had big YouTube presences. Well, let's get this guy because he's got a lot of followers on YouTube. And mm -hmm. they paid him money to perform in the booth. And he said most of them were absolutely atrocious. As soon as it came time to play, they and people would gather around the booth, and some of these guys would freak out, freeze up, or whatever it was. And he said it's because they they're not used to playing in front of people. And I I mean I was shocked, but I wasn't shocked at the same time. Well, that's definitely true. So, um, for instance, one of your first. Uh... Uh, shows live how old were you when you when you were in front of a sizable audience um for the first time and how did you get through that couple beer well, <laughs> um i'm an old man now but back when i was let's say 13 or 14 i was already playing guitar at that point 
but uh, there was a kid in my high school who was a good guitar player at the time, probably better than me. And he had a band with another guitar player. There were two guys in this band and we've just made friends. And um, they said that they needed a singer for their band because they, they couldn't find anybody. And I, I, I could sing. So I just wanted to, yeah, you know what? I'll try it. I like singing. So I'll be in a band. So my first performances in front of, you know, fairly sizable crowds were with that band at 13 and 14, but I was just singing. So I was out front. Wow. Yeah. I, I found recently a friend of mine, a, another friend of mine who was hanging out with us at the time and I'm still close with, he was going through some stuff and found some old photos of some of our gigs. So there's actually on my Facebook page, you can see some pictures and it's pretty damn funny to see how skinny I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Back in the day. Eh? So, um, do you, do you have any, are you working on anything right now? Are you working with anybody right now? Or are you just focusing on your teaching? Um, at this no, point? Um, you know, I, I had a very, very busy year last year with Winger. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. It turns out that Starship was really busy too. So John um, was, was not able to do a lot of the Winger stuff. So we did a six or seven week bus tour in the summer. We had tons of fly out dates on the weekends. And then I went to Japan with them last year. And uh, I mean, I, it was the busiest year I ever had with the band. And right now, like if you're talking about like in the next month or so, it's a little slow for me, but there's a bunch of stuff on the winger calendar for later in the year. It's um, Ron Morgenstein, the, our drummer. Uh, he is going to do a, uh, a Dixie Dregs reunion with Steve Morse. Oh, okay. So he has blocked out a big chunk of time in the spring, like I think March, April, May, or April, May, June, somewhere in there, where he told the winger camp that he's not going to be available. So we're not going to be doing much then. But I, I have, you know, some smaller gigs here in town in LA. I, I do, I do a lot of solo acoustic gigs where I, you know, just play by myself and do stuff like. Uh, I mostly do yacht rock stuff, like from the seventies, AM radio. You know, uh, England, Dan and John Ford Coley, Ambrosia, Bread, that genre of music. And, and I do quite a few gigs doing that. And I love it. So I've got some of those lined up. And uh, I also play with an original band here in L.A. called The Hard Way. Um, we have a couple shows coming up at the Whiskey. I don't have the dates in front of me. but So I'm, I'm busy. But Winger's going to pick up later in the year for sure. And when, when you're doing, um, when you're getting tapped on the shoulder, and, and like we talked earlier, um, um, when uh, they called you when Frank couldn't make a couple of shows, how easy is it for you to get into that Tesla mode oh, or right. that? Okay, you're talking Tesla. We we talked about that earlier today. Yeah. Um, how easy is it for you to get into the mode? And obviously, it's easy for you to learn the songs, but um, do you? go into those um, projects with the mindset of, okay, I'm going to play um, everything, you know, I'm not going to try to stand out. I'm going to play a Frank Hannon guitar solo kind of to the note or, you know, in, in winger or, you, you know what I'm saying? Or do you well, kind of diversify and they give you that freedom? No, I know what you're saying. And to be honest with you, each situation you just mentioned is different from the others. Like, with Tesla, I, I filled in on two different occasions and only a few gigs. Um, the first time was, I think it was 2018. And Frank's father-in-law, who's Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers, his father-in-law was very ill and it, it was touch and go for a bit. But he's okay now, I'm, I'm happy to say. So Frank had to go bedside to be with his wife and to be with Dickie. We had a couple of days where they were playing here. They had like three or four gigs here in the Southern California area. So Frank was able to do the first gig or two. And I was able to go watch. We sat down in the dressing room. He showed me a few things. We, you know, he, we talked through, I was able to go to their sound checks and, um, you know, get a feel for what it was. And, and I used like his guitars and his amps, which is a little nerve wracking. I didn't have any of my own stuff. Oh, wow. And, then on the, by the third gig, Frank had to leave halfway through the gig and go to the airport. So he did like half the gig, introduced me during the gig. I came up and did the last four or five songs. 
And then I did one more full show after that. And, and to get to the actual question, I did stuff as close as I could because Frank's solos are, to me, songs within the song. Good point. If they're not there, it doesn't sound like the song. I couldn't just go and, and play some kind of shred style improvisation. It would, it would sound like bad jazz. I, I would look like an idiot. Um, and then the second time I filled in with Tesla was 2021, right when the pandemic was trying to end mm -hmm. and Frank had COVID and I was supposed to do two weeks. He's like, I'm going to be sick. He was really sick. And he called me, he says, can you fill in? I said, sure. When? He goes, tomorrow night. <laughs> I said, what? He said, oh, you're gone again. Um, it'll come back this time. Okay. It's not, it's not the, uh, I've got a freaking call, but don't worry. Um, um, so I, I said, sure. And, you know, I hadn't played the songs in two or three years. So it was a little nerve wracking. I literally had to like, after hanging up the phone with them, pack my bags and get to the airport within a few hours of the phone call. Right. And I didn't have much time, but to be honest with you, Dave Rude, the other guitar player in Tesla is the most helpful guy ever. He sat with me when I got there, we just sat and like really woodshedded the parts. And he showed me this, this, and this, remember this, he goes, don't worry about singing this. I'll cover it. We'll do this. And I thought that I was, we, we had like two weeks worth of dates and we had two shows in a row, but then we had a bus ride across country where I had three days to go over the stuff. And unfortunately, I was the man after the second show, I went back to the hotel and the manager called me at 11 o'clock at night and said, I'm so sorry, man, the tour is over. And I said, I go, it's not because of me. I, I thought I did a good job. He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, everybody else got sick. So we, we can't like everybody's got COVID. So we went home. So, oh, you know, but I still, you know, I was hoping in those three days that I was just sitting on a bus that I was going to have those parts nailed and if you watch the video there's a couple videos from those two shows I, I did a fairly decent job for having almost no prep time I, you know I, I cringe at a few things when I watch it but I would have learned those exact with winger I know this is a long-winded answer a lot okay. of this a lot of the stuff I mean Reb does all the premier solos because they're his solos and he's there so you know there was one gig where Reb, Reb said you want to play this solo and I said of course I want to play it but no fan wants to come here and pay money to see me play your solos while you're standing 10 feet away. That would be kind of stupid. That's, that's very humble of you, Howie, because but it's, you know, it's true. So it's true. Yeah. Right. So a lot of the stuff that they have for John, like there's a solo solo section that at first was over a blues thing and now they've made it a rock thing, but it's, it's not on a record or anything and it's not well known. So I can do what I want there. And they extended stuff like the song can't get enough. They, we put a solo at the end. It was never there to begin with. So I, you know, I improvise my own stuff over that. So that makes it fun. And then there's a lot of that in that band. So it's, it's great and it's fulfilling. And I love playing with this band. I love it. I love the guys. I love the songs. I love everything about it. That That's awesome. Um, I won't keep you much longer. Um, I'm, I know we had to postpone from earlier because my phone this time it it wasn't the battery or anything. It was uh I don't know. Somebody's calling me and I think it's my <laughs> cord is all effed up. But uh I'd like to thank you for your time. What advice would you give um some people that are watching that are um let's say they're mediocre guitar players that something you learned when you were at a middle level that once you uh, um um got that part of playing um the guitar style that you play which is in my opinion would be like kind of a soloing kind of a style um that that's got you over to the next um genre the, or up a tier like what did you accomplish when you're see see i i give long long-winded questions yeah i'm i sort of know what you're trying to say um you just have to like really focus on every little, if you, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer that. You have to focus on every little nuance. If you're trying, let's, are you saying like trying to learn somebody else's material? Or no, just what I'm saying is what advice would you give to a guitar player that's, um, they're good, but something that you came across when you were good that 
you once you connected the dots in a certain area that made you really good is there something like you accomplished um that put you in a level for where somebody would come back the next time they see you play saying holy shit howie wow uh, no i don't really ever I, I wouldn't say that i was here and then jumped to this i was just always kind of doing a steady this maybe okay. I, guess. I don't know uh, one thing I can say that I see, and I mentioned it earlier, like younger players, like vibrato is so important, the way you make a note sing. So many guys have, and, and younger players that I'm seeing on these YouTube clips, the, the, it sounds like a bad sheep, like, <laughs> and they're just, when they land on a note, they're going, ee, 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 and, and they're holding their hand wrong. They're not using their wrist to kind of really make the note sing. Nobody wants to hear a singer when they when they hold a note and go ha it's horrible they yeah. want a big slow musical vibrato so to, so for my students i always and it's hard to get them to do that when when they're so used to just shaking the note however they can and a lot of guys when they i some of the newer younger players or, or let's say I, I should say newer players whether they're young or old when i say shake that note when you land on it they'll take the neck and shake the guitar itself oh, okay moving the string up and down so i try to tell them it's like if you let's say you're i'd say hold a pretend key pretend you're sticking it in the door and trying to jimmy that key so if you see my wrist motion yeah it's kind of like that so i say just translate that to holding a string and still holding your wrist where you're shaking that note big and slow and the, and the other thing that people don't understand and this I don't know. Are you a guitar player? I'm not even sure. Yeah, yeah, I play. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's say you're gonna you're gonna bend a string and you want to bend a note and then give it that vibrato that we're talking about. <laughs> let's say let's say your note is, for instance, a D and you want to bend it up a whole step to an E, a typical bend. So when you bend, I'm gonna hold my hand like this so you can see it in the camera. When you bend that note up and it reaches a D, you want to shake that note so it sings. A lot of people tend, because bending is a little tricky for a younger player or a more inexperienced player, they'll bend it, but then as they're shaking it, the bend is slowly coming down. When you shake a note, the ear hears the middle of what you're shaking. It, it balances it out. Right. So when you're shaking it and it's too low, here's, here's the note you're wanting it to sound like, but you're shaking it too low, the ear's hearing something lower and it sounds way out of key. So when you bend and you're shaking you want to shake big and slow but on either side of the note it's supposed to be so the human ear averages out what's in the middle of that and it sounds like the actual note so many young players don't do you can watch so many guys on youtube it's it's frustrating because you hear them and they'll they'll play some unbelievable technical thing with sweeping and string skipping and arpeggios and giant stretches that you know nobody can do but them and then they'll land on a note and it's <laughs> and, it, and it dies like oh man it's like nails on a chalkboard for me I, I mean the guys that i mentioned before just listen to john sykes and gary moore two of the best vibratos ever no i mean i i, I can tell obviously you'd be a great guitar teacher because you explain that i understood what you you meant you've got that You've got, let's say your E E note is here, and when you're bending it, if you're going to be, um, um, you're approaching from the vibrato, bottom. you're you're approaching any bend, you're bending up to something. That's right. So that that's you know, so you have to make sure when you're shaking a already bent note that you're shaking above it and below it, and not fast, nice and slow. You know, a lot of guys think they have to shake it. Look, we're all playing hard rock music. You don't have much time. We're all playing as many notes as we can. And I do that too. I'm guilty of that. But when you land on a note, some guys try to shake it as much as they can, get like seven or eight. And it's like, oh man, you're going to get maybe two at the most, you know, two rotations, two and a half tops, and then you're moving on to your next thing. So you got to be able to slow that down. And that's what makes a player who's good become great and people want to listen to that it's more pleasing to the ear so the vibrato is something you're very um focused on teaching your students do you, do you uh, normally teach them or or suggest they learn on acoustic like the young kids that come to no, you or the I, parents? look i 
with everybody's attention span these days being almost non-existent anymore because mm -hmm. of the internet, I tell whoever's, it, whether it's the student themselves or a parent of a younger student, buy them or buy yourself what you want. Don't let, you know, if you want an acoustic, get an acoustic. If you want an electric, get an electric. I don't have, I don't force people to do anything. You want to, you don't play a note and you want to learn how to play an Ingve uh, style arpeggio, I'm going to try to show it to you. I'm going to explain to you that unless you have all these fundamentals, this is going to be next to impossible. But if that's what they want to learn, then I'm going to teach it to them because Otherwise, if you try forcing the old way of teaching, you have to learn this first, you have to learn the three finger chords, you have to learn a bar chord, you have to learn a simple pentatonic scale, people are gonna get bored, lose interest, and then we're gonna have one less guitar player in the world. You have to make sure that you're keeping them engaged and let them dictate what they wanna learn. Eventually, sorry to interrupt, but eventually they're gonna figure out that, crap, this is hard, why is it so hard? And then I say, well, it's because you haven't done all this simple stuff first. You want to try this simple stuff? I'll just show you a little bit of it. And they almost inevitably always say, of course, I want to try the simple stuff. But at first, they don't. Then they realize they need it. Yeah, it's like the foundation because when I was growing up and, you know, guitar teachers would always tell you, play on an acoustic. And the reason being, obviously, to, um, to give your finger strength because um, a, a standard acoustic – the, the action is a bit higher. It's harder to hold down uh, the, the note or the uh, strings to the frets. Whereas you go to an electric, it's a lot easier. So if you want to play a guitar um, properly, you need the foundations. That's kind of what I, I'm getting. I say that too. And I tell them that, you know, uh, nickel wound strings are a little bit rougher on the thing. Uh, sorry, uh, bronze wound strings on an acoustic are a little bit rougher than nickel wounds, of course. And it's much easier. However, you know, if they want to play an acoustic first, I'm not going to steer them away from that. And I'm not going to make them play something that's harder to play too. Cause then again, I watch people lose interest. I used to try to do stuff like that and I would lose students and, and lose, and we would lose guitar players. It's, and that's sad. Right. Uh, before we go to, do you want to, um, do you want to plug your, um, your, your guitar? Yeah, I got nothing to plug. <laughs> okay but, but that's um, it we're, we're done already we just started i thought no that, no it's just no it's, it's um i just don't want to hoping, you know i watched one of your other interviews i can't remember who was with somebody i watched it the other day and you started asking them about canadian artists that they like i thought that was a standard question on this it show. is we, we weren't yeah, done because i've got my list ready <laughs> no we weren't done um i was gonna say yeah thanks for your time i'm gonna put links for um uh, everything underneath uh the description everybody check it out um uh, everybody you're gonna have to check this one out i'm gonna put it down below it's called doctor um uh, don't say it don't say it don't say it funkified oh, mr funkified yeah, that was awesome i mean i gotta tell you that was brilliant yeah, that's Jesus. Eleven, twelve years ago now. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a classic. So you guys got to watch that. It's going to be in the links. I'm going to put a bunch of other uh, stuff. Actually, on um, your website, you had uh, some stuff with Jeff Scott Soto, and that's when he had this little, he had this little puffy hair. He didn't really have the long hair. Well, I, look, I'm going to go on the record here. My website, my website, website <laughs> hasn't been updated since 2005. It's so I know. The internet 1.0 i had somebody who was going to redesign it and he had a family member get sick and then we just sort of lost it and it's so bad that i think it's kind of good but it's it's so ancient and i just i leave it up there i pay a little bit of money for it every year i'm gonna up, i'm gonna have to do something at some point but that's not a place to go to see anything about me anymore really no i know you're saying but, you, but it's a good vintage spot because yeah. you had some good you have some good video links in there i really my, like yeah, my girlfriend well they're so old i would say stay away from that my girlfriend teases me relentlessly because i've got these flame things yeah there, yeah and, that, so that, old and, <laughs> and i think you even had a link to myspace yeah i'm telling you it's it's ancient and there was a a guest book that people used to sign and that there's still a link to that but that guest book went out of business like 15 years ago <laughs> well everything's facebook anyways um so okay let's get to that question and i wasn't gonna not ask you right. um favorite canadian uh artist musician past or present Very Rush. well being originally from buffalo and having family from canada my grandmother was born in toronto i've got cousins up in toronto i just played 
I wound up, John Roth and I switched roles last year, and I actually got to play two shows with Starship, which was great, with Mickey Thomas. Oh, wow. And, uh, that, yeah, there's a whole bunch of links on, on Facebook for, uh, sorry, on YouTube for uh, the first show I did. No rehearsals, just went in and did it, and it was one of the coolest shows I've ever done. And that was near you. It was in Aurelia, Ontario? Um, well, Canada is quite large, so it's yeah. probably about eight hours from me. But oh, um, I th where, where are you located? Um, okay, so you know where the, the Great Lakes, you know where Michigan and Ontario meet, not near Windsor and Detroit, Sault Ste. Marie. Okay. Oh, no, I thought you were closer to Toronto. Uh, well, when people say, you know, where are you? Eastern, like they'll say, like when we do a Zoom interview, I'll say, okay, I'm in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, Toronto. I just say that. Just so oh, people... okay. Yeah, I know where that is. No, you're, that's very far from you. Anyway, yeah. I played about an hour north of Toronto in Aurelia. And I, I reconnected with some cousins who came out to that show who I hadn't seen with since I was, oh, man, 14 years old or something like that. So it's been great. So, you know, I have Canadian blood in me. So um, as far as, like, Canadian artists, man, I love so many Canadian acts. I'm a huge Kim Mitchell fan huge yeah you know outside of buffalo and the entire country of canada most people don't even know who he is <laughs> that's the thing right our our media um isn't like it is in the in the united states like there's a lot of great one of my favorite canadian bands and as soon as i say it i'm pretty sure you're gonna know the killer dwarfs yeah i love the i like the dwarfs not one of my favorites but i i've seen them live a million times and they've you know i've used to go see them play when I lived back there, but they've also been on the Monsters of Rock cruise that I've done a bunch of times with them. I think Daryl Miller, the drummer, is from Buffalo. Yeah, one of the guys one of the guys lives there. Is is it him or the bass player? It might be the bass player. Um I think it's not, the bass player, it, but I'm not sure his name. It could be wrong. Yeah, he goes by Moshi or something. Yeah. yeah. But um I, I was always been a giant Coney Hatch fan. I love Coney Hatch. Andy Curran. And yeah, I have Andy Curran's solo record. A friend of mine played a couple solos on that solo record way back in the day who lived in Buffalo at the time. So I, I bought that record back then and then just think he's brilliant. Um, huge, Carl Dixon. Yeah, love Carl Dixon. Um, I love Harem Scarum. I think they're one of the most underrated bands ever. Yeah. Yeah. You're not familiar. I can see it in your eyes. No, I, I, no to be honest with you, I am familiar 1,000%. I just <laughs> interviewed um, uh, Harry Hess, was it? Yep. So, okay, Harry, so Harry did a solo record maybe 10 or 15 years ago and invited me to play a couple solos on that record, which I'm on. And it was so much fun because he's such a great songwriter. Yeah, I had interviewed him, and, and I know the band here. I'm scared. Him. For some reason, I didn't get into them, and that's not a slight against them because I've heard only good things about them. I, I kind of think when I was in that, when you get into that um, 80s kind of a, a sound and what you're listening to, I was more into Iron Maiden and Priest and Scorpions and Harem Scare when they came out. I thought that they were a popish band, so I didn't really investigate. Gotcha. Their second record is called Mood Swings. I think it was 1990 or 91. And it's, it's a desert island record for me. You know, it's one of my top 10 records of all time. Really? Yeah, it's oh. so good. It's so amazingly. Every every note, every song, perfect. There's nothing wrong with that record. Sounds amazing. It's so well performed. It's, it's incredible. Um, you know, and I, like, you know, of course I love Triumph and I've seen them a bunch of times, but um, I love the first Kick Axe record. And I know they're from the other side of Canada, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I, I do like Anvil. I'm a, you know, I had Metal on Metal when I was a kid. And I've seen them live over the last couple of years and saw their movie. And, and you I saw think, that documentary. Isn't that something how yeah. Metallica said that they were inspired by Anvil? Yeah. Well, and then Anvil, uh, I think it's his, his name is Lips. Um, yeah. he, he still had to work in a friggin' factory in Mississauga and kind of had to pay their way to Europe to play shows. I mean, isn't that, it's just. So he was, he was working, delivering food to elementary schools for them. right so they just i don't know if you're familiar with this about a year year and a half ago they re-released the they redid the documentary a tiny little bit added some stuff and they re-released it to theaters and they had a screening here in los angeles and the band played was there and they played after the movie 
and Scott, oh, wow. Ian, Scott Ian from Anthrax guested with them. They had like the director of the movie was there. There was a bunch of other guests there. And, and I went and, and went to that event and it was amazing. And they made the announcement. They said, you know, a lot of you have been asking, does Lip still have to work that day job? And we can proudly say since that movie came out, he quit that job and has not had to work it since. Oh man! And everybody I mean, stood. Everybody stood up and gave like a standing ovation for that. It was amazing. that is that's a that's a good heartwarming story because, like I said earlier, Canada and marketing and media is is like black and white as it is in say Australia, the United States, especially. Like, there's so many bands that if they were American in Can in Canada, they would be you know your. I don't know what you'd say, maybe your Motley Crue, your Rat, your, you know, yeah. that sort of genre, but because they're Canadian and there's different politics and how we market, how we look at money, how we look at, like, here's my saying, uh, an American will spend a dollar to make a dollar, a Canadian will step over a dollar to pick up a quarter, it just, <laughs> it's just, logically I mean it's different. But there are obviously Canadian artists who have broken through to mega stardom, like Brian Adams and yeah. Celine Dion, and then there's exceptions to the rule, of course. Yeah, Schneider Twain, Lover Boy, yeah, Rush, right. obviously. Right. So but the, the funny thing with Rush and Triumph is they both made their big breaks because they were noticed by a Texas radio station. Yeah, that's true. There were back in those days, Texas radio stations actually broke a lot of stuff. It's kind of weird, but. You know, I don't think Triumph has quite the recognition and and notoriety. Well, not notoriety implies that it's a bad thing, but I, you know, Rush is obviously much bigger than Triumph got, and that's sad because I think you know Triumph should have been just as big. I, I I'm totally agreeable, and I I mean that's probably why I haven't got an interview with Getty or Alex yet. They probably watch some of these interviews or their people because I always say accept Rush because everybody says Rush. But I think it's because everybody just knows the name Rush. But if you're a Canadian, for me anyways, put Rush and Triumph together beside each other. I think Triumph is heads above Rush. But that's just my opinion on the style I like. I like the crunchy guitar, the squeals, the melodic guitar. Whereas um, Rush was more prog right, in, in those course. days. I mean, there was a lot. There's a lot of other smaller bands from Canada that were really, really good that didn't get any recognition at all. Like Santers, I always liked some Santer stuff, and Moxie was another band that was, you know, I think Tommy Bolin played on one of their records, and it just never, nobody knows what it is really. Yeah, yeah. Um, before I let you go, you brought up something about movie theaters, and I, I can't wait. Um, are you itching for this the Spinal Tap uh, movie to come out? The the new one. I don't know man like really yeah because it's it's all the original actors so I it's get that but they're so old now and it's like it was such a perfect movie at the time is, i know is this, gonna, is this gonna tarnish it like well people say that yeah don't fix yeah. it if it ain't broken but i don't know i i was pitching this i was interviewing paul shortino and i said you know paul because um I said, have they contacted you to maybe play Duke Fame again? And we had a good laugh. And I said, you know what? If they do contact you, tell them I've got a line for them. Apparently, the premise is uh, that they have to do one final gig, okay? And they have to get back together. They can't stand each other like a lot of bands are. I said, what they should do is have them talking about it. And then the next thing you know, like they're panning at their face and they're saying, I'll go out there, but I'm not going to fucking after the show uh, just let's just do it and then the next thing you know you see all these nurses wheel them out in their wheelchairs <laughs> on stage so i don't know but I, i'm looking forward to it anyways uh, i've interviewed harry a couple times so i don't know i mean of course i'm gonna watch it but i just have this feeling it's gonna be a giant letdown it's it's definitely not gonna have like the same impact that let's say top gun 2 had you know it's i just think it's I don't know. I, I'm hoping that they really, really make sure that the laughs are, you know, going to be modern day and and well done rather than just kind of rehashing all the old stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Harry, Harry, Howie, <laughs> thinking of Harry Hess. Uh, Howie, thanks for your time. Uh, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? 
Um, I'm going to go with diligence. <laughs> yeah, everybody hit that diligence button. And diligence <laughs> to this channel for these great interviews. Um, thanks again for your time. I'll put all the I'll put a bunch of links below. And um, yeah, everybody, um, they're going to, uh, well, they've already enjoyed that guitar um, shred you sent me because uh, I put it at the beginning of this interview. And like I said, I don't really edit too much, so I'm not going to edit this out. <laughs> That's great. All I right. really appreciate you having me. This was fun. All right, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We will talk soon. Take care. Thank you.